Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's great to be here at the Spark Summit. Um, uh, so thanks uh, for giving, the giving me the opportunity to present today. Uh, it's been really exciting to see Spark come along this far in this short a span of time. Um, so, and of course, being in New York is awesome, except it's February and it's cold, and I didn't realize that. Uh, I used to live here, but having been in San Francisco, California for four and a half years now, even this weather is too cold. Uh, but that said, it's great to be here. Uh, so I'm uh, Ram, I'm uh, the architect for Spark and Data Science at Hortonworks. Uh, I'm also Apache Spark PMC member and committer. Prior to Hortonworks, I was the principal research scientist at Yahoo Research, uh, where I used to work on basically large scale machine learning. Uh, some of the problems that I worked on were login risk detection, like how do you detect when somebody logs into Yahoo servers that they are, them, they are who they say they are. Uh, sponsored search click prediction, so based on what you're searching on yahoo.com or Bing search and so on, what, what ads should we show you? Advertising effectiveness models, and uh, the general area that I worked in is called online learning. Uh, so today I'm gonna be talking about something called Magellan. It's a software that I've open sourced over the last few months. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, I've actually given uh, a talk explaining Magellan at uh, the previous Spark Summit in Amsterdam. So I'm going to avoid talking too much details about Magellan at, the, at, at an introductory level. I will still quickly go through what, it, what Magellan does and why I'm excited about it and why I think people should be excited about it. But uh, let me still set the framework and the context for you a little bit. Um, so basically the problem that we're trying to solve is geospatial analytics, right? And geospatial analytics is any type of analytics that uses spatial structure and spatial context uh, for processing, right? So uh, I've picked three use cases here. Uh, these are, you know, these are just three examples. There's tons and tons of use cases that people encounter. And uh, after the talk, I'd be happy to discuss more use cases or if you, if you can have come up with a new use case, that's even more awesome. Uh, but let's say, uh, take an example as Uber, right? So, Uber collects mobile, mobile data about passengers, about trips, and so on. And if you're Uber, you're likely interested in things like, you know, how does the pickup and drop off neighborhood hotspots change with time, right? So sometimes it's SOMA that's the hotspot for pickups and uh, drop offs in San Francisco. Sometimes it's actually a different region, uh, different neighborhood in San Francisco, and this changes with time. So a problem like this is basically a spatio-temporal analytics problem, right? And this is an example of a business intelligence query that uses geospatial context. So the context it uses here is basically you have mobile data. Somebody has to figure out, given latitude and longitude, what neighborhood of San Francisco or what neighborhood of New York is it, and then use it in an aggregate query or something. Second problem is, uh, this is fairly canonical for uh, railroad companies or transportation companies and so on. So you collect GPS data, so mobile data is basically GPS coordinates. And GPS coordinates have a certain accuracy limitation on them. But let's say that you are a railroad company and you actually have very, very fine measurements about the railroad tracks. What I've shown here is a very smooth curve. Obviously, the real world data is not that smooth. But let's say you have uh, data about the railroad tracks at a feet level. Then can you actually correct these uh, GPS errors? So the idea here is can you correct GPS errors with more accurate landmark measurements? Now, Obviously, to do this, you, can, you have to understand what is actually going along this path, right? If it's a train moving at a uniform velocity, it's easier to correct that. If that's not the case, it's a more complex problem. But in either case, problems like this involve looking at points, snapping them to the closest grid, and figuring out what the point that lies on the grid that's closest to this point is. So it's like an example of a near neighbor query, right? The third piece of it, uh, which is kind of the original problem that I started looking at for geospatial context, is search advertising. Right? So I have an example here where somebody types in Canyon on Google search, and you notice that there's a few things that pop up. Now there is some ranking algorithm that goes and figures out, what do you mean here? Do you really mean a Canyon Hotel, for example, or do you mean Grand Canyon, or do you mean Canyon Ranch, and so on? Now actually, I did this query in Google yesterday, and I was in New York at this time. Now Google Ro Canyon Road, New York City, shows up as the kind of fourth option here, and Canyon uh, Ranch is actually in Texas. So you know, I was really not looking for Canyon Ranch, right? So somehow your search engine should do a better job of knowing where you are and figuring out what query is actually, when you type a partial query, what are you really trying to get at? This is actually not an easy problem, right? 
uh, in essence, you have to incorporate location as a component, as a feature in your information retrieval. And going further, it's a feature in your search ad advertising problem, right? So these are three canonical examples of uh, geospatial analytics. Okay. okay, so that said, while I'm gonna describe what Magellan does and why is it so cool, uh, the first question that I have to answer is, do we really need one more library to do this, right? Anyone who's done geospatial analytics before has used a you know, variety of libraries. Actually, there's probably no single library you would have used, but you would have used a ton and tons and tons of them to do some spatial analytics problem. So that in itself is the first problem, which is there is really no one library that you can use today that does geospatial analytics at scale and uh, solves two problems, which is simplicity and scalability, right? You want the library to be simple to use so you can specify the problems that you're, that you're trying to solve, but you want the library to take care of scale for you, right? So if you sacrifice simplicity to achieve scalability, that's gonna slow you down in terms of development. And the combination of this is actually hard. So it's actually really cool that, you know, I'm giving this presentation here because this is the problem that Spark solves for you in the first place, right? So the reason why Spark is so popular is because it, you don't have to give up on simplicity to achieve scalability, right? Um, and that's also the reason why Magellan is written on top of Spark, as I'll get into. The other piece of it is a lot of uh, geospatial libraries do exist. Uh, at some, you know, if you trade off on simplicity or scalability and so on, but then they don't handle some things really well. So for example, when I give you neighborhoods or when I give you kind of roads and so on, the road is just a geometry. The neighborhood is like a polygonal geometry, right? The context that's attached with it, like metadata, is what describes what is this geometry about, right? Is it a neighborhood or is it something else, right? Is it a lake or a neighborhood, right? Now, metadata is not really handled well in most uh, geospatial libraries that I know of, right? The other piece of it is indexing. So most data formats that exist today for storing geospatial data have not really thought through how to index this data so that you can make scalable queries, right? And the last piece of it is the storage itself is not very efficient. So today, anyone using Hadoop, for example, or Spark knows that you, know, you, you can leverage columnar storage to accelerate your queries a lot. But none of the data formats that exist today are, and are canonical for geospatial actually have efficient columnar storage. The other piece of it is, so geospatial is not just BI, right? It's not simple business queries anymore. Uh, you're starting to ask statistical questions. You're starting to ask machine learning questions. Like I, like I quickly described, the search advertising problem uses geospatial data as, as a component of a machine learning pipeline. When you do that, you want your library to not be a bottleneck, meaning just to do geospatial analysis and add a geospatial feature for machine learning, you shouldn't have to take that data, move it to some other system, run your queries there, get back the aggregated data set and continue with your processing. So one of the goals of writing Magellan was to make this whole thing seamless, right? And lastly, well, this is actually the time to write such a library. So A, there is a lot of explosion of, mo of mobile data. So there's actually a lot of point in space data that we collect today. There is also a very fine granularity of data collection even for geographic data, right? So for example, roads or, or neighborhoods and so on we are collecting data at a much finer grain, right? So it makes the combination of, you know, when you have combination of uh, explosion in mobile data and combination of geometries that are, you know, have a lot of data points in them, the, this really becomes a big data problem. The other piece of it is the analytics actually stretches the limits of traditional BI, right? So there is room for much richer algorithms, there's room for much richer scalable analytics here. And the last piece is, this is the time to do it, and this is also the time where somebody can actually do it in a sensible way, because Spark SQL, Catalyst, and Tungsten already exist, and they go a long way in making the scalability problem simple for, simpler for us to handle, right? Uh, and I'll go through that in more detail. So today, you know, now is really the first time that we've had an open source engine that's this powerful as a SQL engine, and it's not, not just as a SQL engine, as an engine that allows you to extend SQL, right? Um, so, so for all these reasons, this is the right time to do this. So very quickly, I'll introduce Magellan. So basically what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the talk is uh, geometric data. And geometric data can essentially be thought of as points, polygons, and polylines. Points are easy, they are, you know, when I talk about two dimensional points, you can think of them as a tuple of two doubles, right? Polygons basically can have holes in them or they cannot have holes in them, right? So this is a polygon which doesn't have holes in them. And a way Magellan represents this polygon is uh, the array of indices has size one. There's a typo there, there should be a size one array. 
and the array of uh, values has size which is the length of the number of uh, vertices, right? So for example, this one has ver uh, vertices 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, sorry, 2, 1, 1, 1 and so on. So uh, the way it is represented, it is represented making a counterclockwise turn. Uh, that is just convention. You could represent it using clockwise turn as well. And if you have holes in this geometry, then you basically have to tell Magellan or Magellan has to tell you where the, where the uh, contours start, right? So the outer contour starts at uh, edge, uh, at index 0, the inner contour starts at index 5, and then you have a list of vertices, okay? So it is a fairly tight representation as far as representing the data structure itself goes. Now how about reading data, right? So uh, if you are familiar with geospatial data, there is a bunch of formats uh, for storing this data. Two of the most common formats are called shape files and GeoJSONs. So let us assume that you have the New York City uh, neighborhood map stored in either shapefile format or GeoJSON format. What we allow you to do is we allow you to read this as a data frame in Spark SQL, right? So the, the code that you will write to read this is basically you will, you will tell the SQL context that you are using Magellan as the data source and then you will give it a path to load the data from. Now, if you have to load GeoJSON, you just tell me that, tell us that the option, uh, that the, the, the data type is actually GeoJSON. Either way, what you get is basically, uh, you know, logically a table. The table has two columns in this case, uh, because it is neighborhood data, it is a polygon and it has some metadata. Metadata is represented as a map, right? In this case, metadata has basically the neighborhood and the value is Marina, because this is uh, San Francisco. Uh, cool. So that is that's as far as reading data goes. What about uh, queries, right? So here is an example query in Magellan, right? So you have some data that you have already read. You could have, you may have cached it or you may not have cached it. Now once you have this data which is represented as a data frame called na neighborhoods, what you can do is you can, uh, you know, you can ask for all the polygons, all the neighborhoods that contain a given point, right? Now obviously there is only one neighborhood that is going to contain a given point or at most one neighborhood that is going to contain a given point. In this case, it turns out that that point happens to be in North Beach. So the result of this filter is going to give you a new data frame, which has exactly one row in it, right? So the, the thing to notice here is that it is expressing the query is super simple, right? It is, it's, if you are familiar with Spark SQL, this is just very much Spark SQL. The only difference is that we have like a SQL extension that allows you to kind of define things like shape literals. So given a longitude and latitude, point of longitude comma latitude gives you an expression that is a literal, right? Similarly, we have a within operator which basically is a binary expression, it is a Boolean expression, right? It takes two, two, uh, it takes two things, basically two shapes and figures out whether one shape is within the other and so on. So that is as far as kind of queries, simple queries go. What about joints? So let us say you may have a table of uh, neighborhoods and you may have a table of trips. And you may want to say, well, I want, each trip gives me basically latitude and longitude, and I want to know what neighborhood does this point lie in. Essentially, what you're doing there at that point of time is a join, right? And joins are easy to describe here. Basically, it's as simple as what you would say in English: the points dot join neighborhoods where point is within polygon, right? Super simple. Uh, and the result of that is uh, basically gives you point, polygon, and metadata as the new data frame, right? Okay. And you can also do near neighbor queries, for example. Uh, if you think about it, a near neighbor query is basically equivalent to saying that uh, instead of looking for polygons that are close to a given point, I can basically buffer the point by a certain distance, create a geometric object out of it, and look for every other polygon that intersects that object. So it's the same problem, right? So essentially, near neighbor query boils down to the previous type of problem, right? So if I can solve inter intersects or contains or within operators efficiently, I can do near neighbor queries efficiently, right? So very quickly, if I am doing point within polygon, for example, so given a point and given a polygon, I want to know whether a point lies within a polygon or not. That's uh, one of the algorithms that uh, do this is a geometric algorithm. Actually, all algorithms that do this are geometric algorithms. One of the geometric algorithms are uh, is the following, right? So uh, if you notice, if I take a point and just uh, draw a ray going to infinity uh, vertically, uh, from each of the three points that I have represented here. Two of the points are inside the polygon. One of the points is outside the polygon. The ray that goes shoots from the point that is outside the polygon 
meets the polygon in an even number of points, right? Whereas the ray that kind of does this for points inside the polygon meets at an odd number of points. This in essence is the algorithm that Magellan employs or any other ESRI or any of the geometric uh, libraries out there employ for figuring out whether a point is within a polygon or not. The key problem with this is of course that it's an order k algorithm, right? If you have k edges, it basically takes order k time to figure out whether a point is within a polygon, okay? Uh, you can do better if the, so in this case, the polygon had some weird edges and so on, but if the polygon was what's called convex, you could have done this faster. You could have done this in order log k, but a lot of polygons we see in real life are not going to be convex. Okay, so that said, going back to the join that I was just describing to you, one piece of the join is given a point and a polygon, figuring out whether the point is within a polygon. You just saw an algorithm to do that. But the other piece of it is given a data set, data frame of points and a data frame of polygons, figuring out for each point what polygon is contained uh, or what polygon contains this point. So that's a join, right? Now, today what does Magellan do? Because Magellan is written on top of Spark SQL, we really didn't have to write a new join algorithm at this stage. We, even without doing any more work, we already inherit all the join algorithms that Spark provides. And in this case, if the neighborhood table is small enough, it's just broadcasted to every node. And essentially you do a streaming read of the bigger table and do a broadcast Cartesian join. It's a Cartesian join because there is no primary key here. Right? If the neighborhood table is not small enough, then you end up with a regular Cartesian join. So that's the state of affairs right now. Okay, so that's a very quick uh, look at Magellan. So what is its status? Uh, 1.0.3 has been out for a couple of months. Uh, it's, writ uh, it's written in Scala. There is Python code there also, but it's not fully functional yet because uh, it needs to be upgraded to Spark 1.6 for that. Uh, currently, it runs on Spark 1.4. Um, it's available as a Magellan Spark package uh, called Magellan. Uh, it's on GitHub. We have blogged about it. Uh, there's, a no uh, there's a Zeppelin notebook example as well. It supports uh, three of the most common uh, spatial uh, data formats, the ESRI shapefiles, GeoJSON, and OSMXML. So uh, the biggest takeaway I want you to take out of this is go try it out. If you have any kind of geospatial analytics you want to do, go give it a try and shoot me feedback about it. I'm always happy to hear about uh, constructive criticism as well as excitement. Okay? Uh, Okay, so that said, uh, what I'm going to be talking about for the next 12 minutes is uh, what comes next. What comes next in Magellan is Spark 1.6 support, of course, and that's also the point in time where you'll see Python support come in. Uh, the two things I'm going to talk about today are spatial joins and persistent indices, but we also want to leverage tungsten better. Uh, you, today morning, you would have heard the talk uh, from Nong Lee about uh, optimizations coming into tungsten. So we want Magellan to be able to leverage all those optimizations. And a few more operators are coming into Magellan as well in 1.0.4. So going forward, the biggest problem that we want to solve in Magellan next is scaling the Cartesian join, right? So the problem with Cartesian join is that every point has to go to every, basically has to, you know, until I look at all polygons, I don't know whether a point is contained within a polygon or not. And the point within polygon algorithm is complex. So there is a time complexity involved here, which is actually a problem, right? So the biggest problem you see at this point in time is, I told you that we are working on a scalable engine for geospatial analytics, but there's a limit to what we can scale today, right? So yes, I'm also grumpy like that cat. Now, but it's not, you know, it's a solvable problem. So the question is, how do you solve this problem, right? Uh, what do you need to do at this point is figure out, the first logical thing to ask is, should I send every point to every partition? In fact, do I need to? Secondly, within each partition, do I need to look at every point and look at every neighborhood to figure out whether the point lies within the neighborhood or not, right? Uh, clearly, we are doing a lot of work today, but is this work necessary, right? You actually don't need it because one part of this problem is geometries that kind of rarely change, right? So basically, they are either uh, neighborhoods in San Francisco, neighborhoods in New York City, they are roadways, waterways, whatever it is. Those geometries change, but they don't change that often. So you can easily index those geometries and if you can find the right way to index them, then lookups is not going to be that hard, right? So you convert this problem into a pre-processing followed by a faster query processing problem, right? So once you start thinking about indices, there is very many indices, there are very many index indexing techniques that you can look at. Uh, so some of them are quad trees, R trees. Uh, there's also dimensional reduction. Uh, in dimensional reduction, I'll quickly talk about uh, space filling curves. So basically, 
what happens in dimensional reduction is instead of looking at two dimensional indices, we want to look at one dimensional indices, right? Somehow convert the two dimensional problem to one dimensional problem. Now, to do that, I need a one dimensional reduction which preserves nearness. So, if two points are near in the two dimensional space, I want them to be near in the one dimensional projection as well. And I want to somehow enable range queries, right? One of the nice things about one dimensional indices, like what B trees provide for you, is range queries. And, I, and in the case of approximate reduction, for example, I want to have as little collision. So the first way you could have done this is break up your space, in this case a small uh, square, into a few uh, pixels and then just do a uh, row order traversal, right? So in this case, I can start numbering from 0 and say uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 5, 7, 8 are the uh, points. So each, the square on the left will be uh, 0, the square on the bottom right will be 0.8. But the problem with doing this is that the squares, the the left, leftmost square and the square that's right below it differ by the number of, uh, differ by the dimension of the horizontal space, right? And that can be arbitrarily large. So it violates the property that two points that are near to each other in the two dimensional space end up being too far from each other in the one dimensional representation. Same problem with the snake order curves, curve as well. What happens to work is something called a Z order curve. And a Z order curve is as we have seen here. The nice thing about a Z order curve is there's a recursive definition of the Z order curve, right? So this curve actually, if you keep doing this recursive construction all the way through, it's going to start filling the space completely, right? It's what's called a space filling curve. So with the Z order curve, you can actually put a binary representation to it. In this case, you can think of the leftmost top left corner as 0, 0, bottom right as 0, as 1, 1. So traversing the Z order representation is like going higher in binary representation, right? The nice thing about it is if I now recursively define this at two more levels, I get this representation. So a nice property here is that everything that starts with 0, 0 is within the first square that I described, right? So it has a nice containment property. So the properties are locality, two points differing by one bit, for example, are close to each other. It's got containment as a property. It's very efficient to construct. If I know the x and y coordinates of a point, I can give you the binary representation right away and vice versa. And it's got some nice bounds on how accurate this is. And if you're familiar with geohashing at all, geohashing is basically Z order curves where you take the binary representation and convert it to a 32-bit base, 32-bit uh, encoded string. So I'm going to skip a bit about geohashing and stuff like that. So once we have this kind of a scalable, uh, this kind of a way of constructing spatial indices, how do you speed up joins? The way you speed up joins is you pre-process the points. For each point, figure out the geohash or the spatial index associated with it. For each neighborhood, you won't have a unique index or a unique geohash. You're going to have a collection of them. So on the one hand, you have a single geohash for a point. A, a particular shape will be covered by one or more geohashes. And then you can just do inner join by the geohash, right? So when you do inner join and geohash, you're now not sending every point to every partition, right? So this actually speeds up the, the computation quite a bit. There's a little bit of an edge case here because the squares that cover the, the geometry have a certain precision. So even though a point and a polygon may share a geohash, it doesn't mean the point is within the polygon. It could happen that they just share the same box, right? Uh, so there are edge cases that you have to deal with, but you won't have too many edge cases if the polygons are well, you know, uh, fill the space well enough, right? Okay, so that's basically the, the uh, upshot. So essentially Magellan 1.0.4 is working on spatial joints, and spatial joints solve this problem of, you know, being able to laterally scale these kind of joints. Uh, and in Spark SQL, because Spark SQL is written in an extensible manner, it's very easy for us to plug in all these algorithms right into Spark SQL. What we do is basically define a new strategy uh, called a spatial join strategy. The strategy decides whether it's even worth it to do this join in, a, in this manner, right? There are some scenarios where it's just too much work to do this and it's faster to just do a broadcast condition join. In that case, we just fall back to the canonical join. Otherwise, we handle this ourselves and we override the binary node to figure out how, how the physical execution plan should look like. And then we stitch it up together as an experimental strategy in Spark SQL. So that's basically a quick uh, description of what Magellan does uh, and uh, where, where we are going next. And the big problem that we are trying to solve is spatial joints, which should make scalable geospatial queries happen, uh, you know, not only happen, but uh, happen under the covers without you having to worry about it. The nice thing about it is when we release 1.0.4, because of the way it's written on top of Spark SQL, we add a new sp spatial join strategy, and everybody who's using the previous version of Magellan already gets this enhanced join. So you don't really have to kind of worry about these kind of joins and so on. 
The framework takes care of this for you, right? Again, this is possible because we've kind of hijacked Spark SQL to do this. Uh, so it, it wasn't too much work on our side. So basically, the simple answer here is the join implementation was too slow. We leveraged spatial indices, which is a construct in, in geometric algorithms, and Catalyst, which is a property of Spark SQL, to fix this problem, right? Uh, so I think I'm going to end with this, basically. Um, so uh, my Twitter handle and GitHub coordinates are here. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any more questions about uh, Magellan. I think that's it. Cool. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, we've got about four minutes for questions. So raise your hand, and I will run to you to ask the question. So first one here. Okay. Hello. Um, hey. Did you have a reason for using GeoHash versus Rtree or Quadtree? Or, I mean, yes. did so, you look at the performance difference? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for, uh, we actually don't use GeoHashes. We use Z-order curves. But GeoHash is the same thing when you fix the latitude, longitude, and do this. So GeoHashes are nice because you get the nice string representation. But the problem with GeoHashes is that they work only with longitude, latitude, right? A lot of times you take very accurate measurements in custom coordinate systems because it allows you to kind of go past the GPS coordinate limitations. Um, so, you, so you need something that works with very accurate custom coordinate systems, which the z-order curves do. But short answer is that uh, there isn't much of a performance difference in this kind of setting uh, when you're scaling out between uh, R trees and uh, z-order curves. Actually, quad tree is basically a z-order curve, right? Once you have the z-order curve, you're you essentially getting to the the, the leaf node of a quad tree, right? Uh, but it's a eas lot easier to construct this, and it's a lot easier to, once you have these indices constructed, you can kind of now, you can have a scenario where you dump these indices somewhere and maybe pull it up in Elasticsearch and so on and run aggregate queries on top of that. You already have everything you need. Otherwise, I would have to re-implement the R-tree algorithm in a completely different environment and so on. So it's just much simpler to deal with. Uh, and performance is really, it's fast enough. Yeah. yeah. So just a quick question about syntax. Earlier you were showing us this point within polygon yeah. syntax. Can you do that in Python? Because you mentioned the next yeah, yeah. is good. Yeah, you can do this in Python as well. Uh, in Python, it's uh, in Spark SQL in Python, you'll do a point dot within. Uh, but in Scala, you can, uh, you can avoid the dot. It's just a syntactic sugar that you get in Scala. But it, it's the same thing. You can do the same thing. Sorry? Is it like an implicit function? Yes, in Scala, it's an implicit function, exactly. Hi, yes, yeah. uh, do you currently support uh, like datum transformations and the coordinate transformations or? Yeah, so we have a general coordinate transformation framework and I've written a few for things like NAD83, right? It's like a state plane coordinate systems and so on. So this, if you're doing Lambert conic projections or Mercator, transverse Mercator, you can use the libraries I've written. But long term, I don't want to kind of support that because there's a new project that's coming out called Apache Sys which basically does this coordinate transformations for you. It's supposed to, right? Uh, so we are still talking to them to figure out how we can kind of collaborate together. So while we have a general coordinate transformation engine, the specific coordinate transformations, you will have to either do it yourself or use one of the third party libraries. But they plug into this framework. Yeah. Cool, we have one time for one more question. All right, all the way in the back there. Hi, does Magellan currently have support for map matching? No, so I started working on that, but it's kind of been on a back burner for now. Uh, it's a very good question. So map matching is a super interesting problem. Uh, we haven't done enough work on it. So it's, it's, on, a, it's, on, uh, it's on the roadmap, but uh, we, we can catch up offline as to what we've done. Yeah. Cool, well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Ram, for this awesome presentation.